Yep. We'll just give it another uh, 30 seconds or so for those that have already logged in. Thank you. There's unfortunately no way of knowing um, at this present moment how many are logged in. So I'll just give it just give it another little bit of time for those that are joining us this morning. All right, we'll we'll get started. The, uh, thank you for thank you for joining those that have logged in today. Appreciated. Um, my name is Scott Chalmers. I'm based uh, in Queensland, so I have responsibility for the the eastern part of Australia. And I will be joined by George DeChico, who's based in our head office in Adelaide, in South Australia, and Ajit Kokani as well will present a case study from Western Australia, who's based in Perth. So trying to give, I guess, a little bit of a spread of um, across across the continent and on the sort of projects that we that we get involved with as part of our rental solution business. Uh, Kim, if you can potentially go to the first slide. So for those that don't know anything about Osmoflow, uh, we're essentially an independent integrator technology company based around essentially membrane technologies for water treatment. Um, around about 30 years, uh, started in, uh, I think it was 91, or might have actually even been 92, uh, approximately a couple hundred employees, and that sort of varies a little bit depending on the workload and the project delivery side of the business predominantly, and about 480 odd projects over that period. A large portion of our business in reality is uh, O&M, division of the business, and there's around about 118 remote control and O&M contracts in place. Uh, because it's obviously not just about delivery of projects, the capital portion or, or deployment of rental assets. It's about their ongoing operation and maintenance, which you know is typically 15 to 20 years uh, with any given asset. So that's a big part of the business. And uh, in some cases we have finance that we've got approximately eight build and operate contracts. The it, it is our business is based around, uh, as I say, membrane based technologies. And we often get involved in, I guess, the more difficult applications where now, process expertise is required and it's a part of our business to obviously provide and guarantee uh, the process warranties that are required for any given water challenge. Um, sometimes it's an EPC turnkey kind of project, um, sometimes they're international, but it would be fair to say that the majority historically of our applications and projects have been delivered in Australia and that is our head office in Adelaide. The part of the business that we're talking about today is uh, obviously the rental, the rental water systems part of the business. Most people think, I guess, I think most people think that that's the typical way um, a rental looks, and that is true to a degree. The bulk of the rental fleet assets are containerized because they do lend themselves well to deployment to remote locations, given that they've got their own uh, enclosure. Uh, they are protected from the elements, uh, and the plant can be completed to a much higher degree so that uh, minimizes the site works and maximize the amount of uh, testing that we can do off site. So that is a fairly typical um, looking rental. Shipping containers, whether they be 10, 20 or 40 footers, that's a fairly common configuration, but not necessarily exclusively. So the model or how a typical rental will be executed, obviously there's an inquiry made by a, a, a particular client in a variety of industries and a variety of water challenges. Um, we have to have a, a good 
uh, discussion up front to really understand what the driver of the project is, what the real needs are. Uh, and that's an, that's a critical step fundamentally before we then develop a solution and look at what assets are available and how can that, how they can be potentially utilised to solve those challenges and meet those needs. Uh, then a proposal will be generated and if uh, if, ever, if it's in agreement, we'll then move to uh, mobilisation phase, which is where the plant is prepared. We'll do a factory acceptance test and dispatch to site. Usually run in parallel, there'll be some site um, uh, mobilisation and potentially some balance of plant is, is the site is prepared, ready for the containers or the skids and the primary process units to arrive. Um, that can involve tanks, it can involve pump stations, um, it could just be site works, civil works, potentially concrete sleepers for the containers to sit on, a variety of different services which we'll, we'll work with the client to talk about so that we can minimise the overall time for the total project execution. Uh, the picture below is, is, an, is a typical example in that particular project which was in central Queensland for a coal seam gas company. You can see uh, that's actually a, a ultra filtration system on the left hand side and a reverse osmosis system on the right hand side and in that case they uh, required some protection from the elements and the shade structure between them with some chemical dosing and some large tankage to the right and power generation on the left. So that was the entire site uh, and that's not an atypical temporary um, setup. Uh, once the plan is installed and commissioned, which is as they usually done in conjunction with the client, um, we'll, we'll then provide a range of services for op ongoing operation and maintenance. It can be exclusively by Osmoflow, it can be exclusively by the client with just our technical support, or usually it's a little bit of both depending on the location, the geographic location and the criticality of the application. And at the end of the term, obviously there's a deconstruction or a decommissioning stage return to Adelaide where it's, uh, uh, it's refurbished to a degree. So that clients vary um, across all the, all the different sectors, but I, I guess they would be the top five or six there, mining, oil and gas, coal seam gas, power generation, food and beverage, and in some cases, municipal climates. And, and the requirements vary from literally emergency water needs, perhaps they're running out of their normal water source, or perhaps the alternative water, water source is of inferior or lower quality and requires additional treatment. Sometimes it can be for a temporary shutdown, as happens in power stations, uh, in some cases where they've got to do a, uh, they, they need a temporary water supply or deem in water supply for a, a startup or a recommissioning of a turbine or something. Um, it can be for an environmental compliance so that they can potentially discharge water because they've got an inventory of water that's building up on the mine site, as an example. Um, a variety of different needs, but the thing that they have in common is that they're either needed urgently and there's no time to execute a customised project. So you might you may well do a, a rental project whilst a permanent installation is being designed and, and delivered, or it's it's truly temporary in nature. So it's only needed for a short term period, typically between one month and a, and a couple of years. So of course, because the the applications and the industries that we service are varied, the the capacities and the configuration and the type of processing equipment that we need that, that we need to keep on hand also varies so the capacities range between roughly 100,000 litres a day and potentially up to 30 megalitres a day um, they can be skidded in some cases but the majority are containerized as i said previously the the primary process units that we obviously um, rely on for most applications involve desalination and that can be either seawater RO, it can be brackish water RO, in some cases nanofiltration. Um, it can be, uh, it, it, usually there will be a requirement for some form of pretreatment. So again, application specific, it could be membrane filtration in either a micro or ultra filtration format. In some cases, multimedia filtration might be sufficient. In some cases, activated carbon AC might be sufficient. In some cases, if the water's of high quality, cartridge filtration alone might be uh, sufficient. Again, in some cases, post treatment may be required for either pH adjustment or for remineralization, potentially if it's a potable application. And uh, demineralization in some cases is required for iron exchange, so it could be for boiler feed or those kind of applications. 
just so we get an idea of what the different units potentially look like. That is a ultrafiltration asset in a 40 foot container. That one would do from memory about one and a half megalitres a day. I think that capacity was and they range in size from around 50 cubes to some very big capacity systems theoretically can be deployed um, either in ultrafiltration or microfiltration um, membranes. Um, most of them are containerized, but the bigger the capacity, more likely it is that the skids will be deployed because obviously the constraints of a container wall do limit the amount of modules and membranes that you can fit inside. They're plug and play to maximum extent possible. So they are typically fairly self-sufficient with onboard um, you know, motor control centers, uh, air compressors, blowers, instrumentation, uh, cleaning, cleaning systems. As much as possible, we like to keep them self-sufficient and that, that helps obviously with rapid deployment. And generally they will have some sort of remote monitoring capability because that's a, that's a very cost effective way in our experience to support the assets once they're in the field and particularly across Australia in the more remote locations, remote monitoring and operation is, is very valuable. Um, sorry, multimedia filtration, MMF, in some cases is, is, uh, is useful. That application was actually on the coast of Queensland uh, was from memory around 10, 12 megalitres a day um, for essentially uh, filtration only was required to remove turbidity from uh, a water, a, a surface water source that was then actually used as fire water on a coal uh, terminal. And that particular application is so quite a large capacity system. Again, they can be containerized or skidded uh, with a with, uh, variety of capacities. So the, the RO systems, as I, as I said earlier, um, they can be seawater systems and the picture on the top left where there's a single 20 foot container, that's, an, that's a fairly typical example of a temporary setup that was actually on, a Torres, on an island up in the Torres Strait uh, for a relatively small capacity for the local community. And you can see temporary poly tanks, you can see some generators in the background and the primary process units literally uh, the intake right next to the container and probably the brine discharge not too far uh, away either. So, you know, very much a temporary setup, uh, tip, fairly typical seawater, small seawater application, but they can be brackish water. And in some cases, we also have some high pressure brackish water systems, which are obviously designed for higher salinity, sort of hybrid kind of water sources. They can be deployed with nanofiltration membranes and the capacities as I say, also range between some relatively small systems for seawater. There's a couple of very small systems right through to many millions of litres a day, uh, depending on the client's requirements. And that is a that is an important part of the, the 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 concept of a rental. In some cases, they are literally deployed for emergency applications. Um, in the recent bushfires in uh, across Australia, we were required in a couple of locations to essentially emergency. Uh, supply of water treatment equipment because the existing infrastructure had been damaged or burnt in the bushfires. So we are called upon to respond to floods, droughts, uh, bushfires, those kind of um, natural events. Uh, so having having stock in hand, having the ability to rapidly test and mobilise is, is an important part of the rental business. And then of course after it's uh, commissioned, and uh, installed on site um, where, where we utilise you know, commissioning Osmoflow in-house resources for those commissioning and, and project management services will then usually rely or at least in part the regional operational team will be involved. Uh, what we call a plant owner will be assigned to support the site uh, and that, you know, that, that can be full-time operations if it's a critical application and the client has limited operational experience or, or, or resources available. So we can we can fully operate and maintain the equipment or we can support them. But usually at bare minimum, there is a remote monitoring uh, and operational assistance via our 24 seven control center in Adelaide, which is a, a, a very cost effective uh, access point for experienced uh, resources to support that installation wherever that might be across the world. And you can see an example there on the right hand side. That's a tin, an abandoned tin mine actually in northern Queensland. Apart from the, the lovely different uh, contrasting colours between the blue sky, the red rock and the green water, that's a fairly, uh, I guess, typical 
temporary setup for a rental, multiple process units and containers, uh, generator for power supply, and the required process tankage between those process units with an intake structure you can see snaking out into the dam. So I'll hand over to George DeChico, who's based in Adelaide, who was involved uh, for the Broken Hill uh, project we did a couple of years ago. Thanks for that, Scott. Um, yeah, so I'm based in uh, Adelaide uh, for Osmoflow, uh, and yeah, I was in, certainly involved in this uh, project uh, that we did for Broken Hill. Um, Broken Hill was facing some uh, severe drought conditions, and um, and there were some uh, si significant um, uh, there was significant uh, impacts of of the drought. Uh, that that we're having on that uh, on that site, um, there there was a need to change in uh, the water sources uh, due to the existing sources being uh, unable to to contribute to that uh, to the water supply needs of the community. So um, that led to fewer options, and um, and then as a result of the drought, a higher salinity being forecast. Um, one of the factors that uh, was also relevant uh, to this project was that uh, brine uh, had to be minimised to um, below two megalitres a day, um, despite the community demand being up to 13 megalitres a day. Uh, there was an existing uh, treatment plant at the site uh, that was uh, comprising a cartridge filter and a brackish water RO treatment. Um, of a total of about six megalitres a day, but that was originally designed uh, with a 75% recovery uh, two-stage RO design, uh, and uh, it was treating it designed to treat uh, based on the uh, conventional treatment plant that uh, that that regularly operates on the site, um, comprising of a clarifier and uh, media filter and UV chlorination, which is quite typical of. Uh, most water treatment plants around around the nation. Um, there's a couple of uh, photos there. So the photo on the bottom left is uh, is a photo of the plant as it was installed um, finally. And uh, uh, during uh, there was the initial four uh, containers which are on the um, just adjacent the uh, small shed that's there on the far right on the photo, if you can see that. Um, there's uh, also there was another a few other rental assets that were provided to meet that um, that need and that expansion in the capacity required. Um, as part of the project, because of the uh, existing plants were you know sort of around ten to ten to eleven years old, then. Um, Osmoflow also undertook some refurbishment of those assets um, at site, and uh, there was a um, and there was a fairly limited uh, amount of time available to to work on those uh, on those assets and and bring them up to up speed, and also to prepare the assets to uh, to do the. 90% recovery that was ultimately needed uh, to achieve the minimum brine volume that the client or the maximum brine volume that the client had uh, available in their in their um, fleet. Uh, the, one of the other interesting aspects of this project was that um, we combined the assets um, to, to meet those that 90% recovery target, and uh, and we had to deliver this project in a turnkey fashion in a very tight time frame, uh, which was 12 weeks of uh, of an initial um, design and, and fabrication of some of the equipment and balance of plant, as well as uh, factory testing that equipment uh, and supply and install it and commission it on site. Uh, one of the uh, other thing that uh, was of relevance here is because of the location of Broken Hill being quite central to uh, to, uh, to Australia, uh, the 
uh, the remoteness of the location meant that um, you know on-site super support of the plant you know was was sort of limited. Uh, there was already existing water treatment plant personnel, but they didn't necessarily have a lot of experience operating RO plants, uh, so they were not so familiar with the day-to-day -day operation of a full-scale plant at, of this uh, of this magnitude. And so they uh, relied on our 24-7 remote monitoring and support um, from Burton in Northern Adelaide. And uh, we also provided them with some local uh, personnel on the ground to assist uh, in the day-to-day -day operation. So I'll just pass it on to uh, Padgett now, who uh, will talk about the uh, case study at the um, Mount Marion project in uh, WA. Thanks, Ajit. Thanks, George. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on which part of the world you are based in. Uh, I would like to share our experience with one of the interesting, challenging and truly fast track project we delivered here in Goldfields area in WA. This was for lithium mine site for CSI Mount Marion. Uh, clients existing water treatment plant on site was struggling and hence it was impacting their production and uh, based on the lithium demand at the time client wanted to ensure their processing plant is uh, running at a full capacity and to achieve that they needed uh, security of uh, water supply they contacted us uh, pretty much asking uh, okay do you have a uh, rental plants available to have it uh, sent to site like yesterday and we did have few rental plants available on hand and we offer them uh, to have it uh, available for collection from our factory within five days after factory testing. And the plants were delivered to site within eight days. What we supplied part of the package was a three megaliter day UF seawater RO plant comprising about eight containers and number of ancillary skids for BOP such as uh, self screening filters high flow cartridge filter, low pressure pump, etc. Once the plant was delivered on site, uh, well, they needed uh, some support to have the plant installed. We provided them installation supervisor support to support their contractors with electrical, mechanical and uh, civil works. Also, Client re requested our services to fast track the commissioning and uh, we mobilized a team of commissioning engineers to do 24-7 uh, commissioning on back-to-back -back shift. This was a plug and play plant and commissioning went very smoothly and within 28 days plants started producing the water. Initial contract was for six months. However, you know, based on the performance of the plant, client decided to continue beyond six months period. Part of the support uh, we provided 24-7 uh, full-time operators as well and also we did have 24-7 control room support as well on the back end. If you can see on this picture at start of the rental project, uh, the water from the ghost crib we were putting into the plant was about 24,000 TDAs and you can see from the color that sort of greenish is a more of a quite a bit of algae in the water. Just after one year operation, the TDS level went up to 39,000 and you can see from that second picture, water level went quite down. At end of two and after two years period, we were looking at treating water of about 45,000 TDAs and uh, our overall rental period on this plant was uh, two and a half years. And uh, this was a really challenging project with varied quality of water throughout the rental project. And we continuously provided uh, processing support to make sure the plant performance was uh, up to the plant's requirement. Now I'll hand over to Scott to share his experience about another interesting project in Queensland at Mount Isa Mount site. Thanks, Scott.
Apologies. <laughs> the uh, yeah, Mount Isa in northwest Queensland, of course, has a, a population of around twenty four thousand. It's an interesting municipal site in that um, they have a natural filtration system, which is essentially a clear water lagoon that sits off to the side of the main lake called Lake Mundara. And it goes through a reed bed essentially before it's pumped towards the city for use as potable water for the population and actually to the mine itself. It's managed by what used to be Mount Isa Mines now, Glencore. They had a um, they had a problem with uh, essentially decreasing water supplies, lowering of the levels in Lake Mundara, which essentially led to algal blooms. And you can see in the bottom picture there a shot in what they call the terminal reservoir, which is essentially the reservoir that the, the water from the lake is pumped into before it goes into the network. It's at a, a sort of a turkey's nest kind of configuration near the township itself. So you can see relatively high, quite high algal content. And of course, after chlorination, that can lead to disinfection byproducts, which are uh, essentially undesirable for the public. It, became, it, be, it really become a public health issue. The, they, that was the reason that they had the, the need the the challenge was uh, significant in that the total algae levels really it's the algae that was the primary problem as you'd expect this turbidity and suspended solids you can measure it by a, a couple of different metrics but a fundamentally high algal count um, meant that yeah, any chlorination or disinfection of the system would lead to those byproducts were undesirable so they wanted to obviously remove those and the other challenge was it was also quite a large capacity 20 megalitres was the minimum capacity that they they required on site, which is you know, quite a high, uh, quite a high flow for a temporary deployment, and they needed it as quickly as we could get it to them because it was coming into summer, uh, and uh, it was you know, essentially un unacceptable the quality as it was. So the solution was to essentially mobilise the vast majority of what we had available in the membrane filtration. We thought we needed to go to membrane filtration or ideally wanted to use membrane filtration for its ability to fully remove the algal cells. And so we deployed in two different phases, those, the top three units. There was three of the, the very top unit, one of the 1.4 mega day and a 1.2 smaller system in a 20 footer that was deployed as phase one in the project. Whilst we then refurbished and made ready for deployment uh, second phase, which is two five meg systems giving total capacity just under 20 megs with, with a bit of a push 20 megs a day. The timeline for that project was um, between, I think we got the inquiry, I'm going to say probably around early October, we took the call. Um, a site visit was actually undertaken pretty much straight away to have a look at the logistics and where these could be located. Uh, and it was actually on the bank of the terminal reservoir. Uh, within three weeks, we had deployed um, the first phase, which was around 10 meg capacity, as well as the uh, panel tank that you can see there in that middle photo. We had a, a, a large panel tank with a bladder that was from another project that we were able to supply to them as well. Mount Isa Water Board themselves managed the site works and the interconnecting pipe work uh, before our units were then to, um, brought into place and put down on, on, on the bank with the appropriate civil structures in place. And around uh, a, a month later, we had the other 10 megalitres a day there. So uh, the whole lot was operational at the end of 2013. And it's actually, if we go to the next slide, Kim, has actually been um, has actually been in place now for, well, since, since that time, they turned it into a permanent uh, process because they were, the, obviously once the population had got used to the water on the right, which is the same reservoir, uh, after filtration, so that's the, that's the before and after photo. As you'd expect, membrane filtration does an excellent job of removing the algae. So once that was in the network, there was really no going back from the water board's perspective. There were some challenges on the way. So after we um, after we had run the rental for about a year, they realised that, that that it was it was doing a good job, and they really wanted to keep it there. We subsequently took out half of those assets and replace them with the with the larger capacity units so they're all consistent um, their permanent plant now consists of actually five uh, five meg containers um, but we've had certain under certain circumstances we've had very high algal counts uh, up to five million cells were, have been recorded which is you know, ex extremely high levels of algae and when they in some cases they do have they do have the ability to blend from 
couple of different water sources and the secondary water sources can have iron and manganese levels dissolved iron and manganese levels and that has caused in some instances some fouling of the membranes uh, precipitating within and, and downstream of the membrane systems but we've been able to recover the membranes and actually come up with some quite quite efficient cleaning regimes as part of normal routine operations so they now have a, a permanent system online It's worth mentioning for the the occasional larger capacity requirements uh, that Osmoflow has access to um, four seven megalitre a day large capacity seawater desalination modules. So all four together have the potential to produce 28 megalitres a day of treated water. Um, they are available for uh, pre-inspection and that's actually set up in the trade free zone in Dubai. These are in the UAE at present. Two of those modules, so two of the four blocks are currently deployed. Uh, there's still two available, uh, but collectively that's quite a large capacity system and that comes with um, you know, the seawater pumping containers, strainers. It's got a UF pretreatment system, obviously the RO systems with energy exchange via pressure exchange devices, um, CIPs and, and power control and all the all the interconnecting pipe work between those devices. So it's designed for rap, you know, as, as rapid as can be achieved. Um, and I think the most recent one that was delivered was in Thailand for that project. And I think just to give someone or not, there, is, there was a question, I believe, about how long. So that's obviously quite a large system. And some of the time for deployment of that one would have clearly been shipping. But I believe from the from a ward to start up and producing water was around 12 weeks for that project. So I'm I'm not actually fully aware of the shipping time, but I would think it was probably three to four weeks, at least from Dubai. So that would be considered to be rapid for a system of that scale. Uh, that would be quite a quite a quite a rapid deployment and operation. And we do have a video of uh, of sort of a fly through video of the assets, both uh, inside and outside, if you're interested. And I think uh, Kim can probably send you um, send you a link rather than look at it here. We can send you a link. I think it's a YouTube video. You can have a look at that if that's of interest. So if there if there are uh, any questions that um, George, I might let you if you want to answer if there's any questions there that have come through. Yeah, I guess uh, we've uh, responded uh, to a few of the questions already. But I guess we can um, have, a, have a quick mention of them. So um, uh, I guess you already sort of responded about the one that's about how quick is it is rapid. Um, but I guess the I guess one of the other questions was about the self-sufficiency of the of the assets. Um, I guess it's important to recognise that these things are already uh, pre pre-designed, pre-engineered um, systems in effect uh, that we tweak and modify to to meet the various requirements of every customer. And um, and I guess if that's that's the objective of, of the thing. So I guess they, that's the whole, whole idea of having it containerized and that they're well capable of, del of uh, delivering when it comes to operational phase uh, and obviously doing that in a faster track manner as possible. Um, I don't know if you want any to add anything there, Scott. But yeah, uh, that was my thought there. And then um, in respect to how many containers we have in our fleet. So I guess we've got a, about 100 assets uh, globally and majority of those are located in, in Australia but uh, and deployed in Australia currently. So uh, but uh, always uh, looking for any other opportunities we can uh, deploy whatever other assets we have available at any given time. Yeah. I think it's probably just worth saying there, George, that um, that yeah, the 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 predominantly you know although we have you know what 75 or you know around about 70 or so assets in Australia and over 100 available internationally that gives us although that gives us a very broad uh, pool to pick the, the the most suitable asset for any given application water chemistry is site specific it's client and and the site client specific requirements vary massively from power stations to mining companies to oil and gas companies to municipalities so 
given that we're using available assets, it's always a little bit of a square, I call it the square peg in the round hole. So depending on how much um, modification of the assets is required, that can significantly impact on the time that's required to deploy. And then obviously you've got the, the site setup factor and it varies widely um, depending on how far you've got to bring the water from and how far you've got to push it to and a lot of other variations. So it's not just about the boxes, that's quite clear. It's also about the balance of plant and the overall project considerations, but we have all the available internal resources um, in-house for mechanical, electrical, project management, whatever else is needed to help you navigate all of that, or it can be turnkeyed if you like the entire site can be delivered as a sort of a greenfield site by Osmoflow. So it's very site specific, um, but there's a big pool of assets to potentially draw, draw from. Unless there are, uh, is there any other further questions, George? No, there's no other really any questions further. I guess if anyone had any other questions, I'm sure they can uh, uh, email them through um, after this session. So yep. um, we'll more than happily respond. But, so, yeah. I, think Kim, I think Kim will send out uh, my contact details and George's and Agents. If you're in, if you're in any of those parts of Australia, then by all means, feel free to contact us so we can talk to you more about specifics and uh, I think also going to send through the, the link for the fly through of the large capacity systems. So if there's no other questions, we'll um, thank you. Thank you very much for your attendance. We hope to meet you, meet you all shortly out there in the water industry.